What we are covering in this lesson is, number one, this idea of thinking about the derivative and only thinking about it geometrically. Now, what's the opposite of that? We know how to work out derivatives using algebra, right? If I gave you something like, say, x to the power of 5, we should know how to differentiate that even without putting any words there. It's going to be 5x to the 4. You didn't need to know what x to the power of 5 looked like. You could just sort of think about the numbers in the algebra. It's fine. And we could give you a product or we could give you a function of a function, uh, x minus 1 all to the power of 5, and you would handle that no problems, right? But what you're looking at here, and on that piece of paper there, is a function and you don't know anything about its equation, which means that you can't use all of your power rule, quotient rule, product rule, all that kind of thing, because you've got no algebra to deal with, right? Now before we get stuck into how to actually do this, I want to make sure there's some justification for this, right? Why do we care about thinking about derivatives visually? Well, hopefully you guys can make out, sorry I cannot move this screen, so it's over here and a bit easier for you all to make out, especially right here. But um, sometimes you'll get a graph, right? There's some physical phenomena that you want to understand, like the growth of a population, right? Or for instance, the spread of a disease inside someone's body, and you don't get an equation for that, right? You just have data. You just take measurements, you, me you collect blood, you put them in the machine, it's like, oh yeah, this is what we think of the T-cell counts at the moment. And you track it over time, and then you've got this graph. Well, what can you do with this if we want to understand how it's changing? Calculus is still the tool that we use, but all that power rule, question rule, all that doesn't help us. So now when you have a look at something like this, pen in hand, and your ruler as well, how could we go for an object like this? You can see this first set of axes, it's the y-axis there. What we're going to graph beneath it, just look down, it's very small, but hopefully you noticed, that's not the y-axis there, that's the y dash. This is the derivative. We're going to do the first derivative of this, and we're actually going to do it again, as you'll see, that's why there's so many spots there. Let's turn off my Wi-Fi, we don't need that. Okay, so here's the first thing I'd like you to do. Have a look at this graph and have a think about, in terms of calculus, where are the most interesting or important places on this graph? A place where you can maybe tell me something. Yeah, go ahead. Where the line the okay, so fantastic. Let's all mark in. I count one, two, and three spots where our graph, our function, intersects with the x-axis. So we call these guys the x-intercepts, right? There's three, so if you had to make a guess, we don't have the equation, but what would you think, what would you guess the equation of this thing would be like? Being that you've got three x-intercepts. X, like a cubic function? Yeah, very good. Uh, x cubed and then some other terms after it. It's not going to be an x squared or something like that, because this is not a parabola, right? It's not going to just be like 5x or something like that, because it's not a straight line, yeah? So we know what we're expecting. Now when it comes to calculus, it turns out that these particular spots are actually not that important to us. It's more about how the graph changes. For example, I'm going to mark in these two spots here. Can you see the spots? I'd encourage you to mark them on your graph as well. These two spots are really important when it comes to calculus. They have a special name. Have you guys encountered the name of this yet? Yeah? What would you call it? Yeah, we're going to work out, we are going to work out some tangents actually. You're anticipating my second half of the lesson. When you work out the tangents for these two spots, what's special about the tangents at both of these locations? They're going to be, can you do it with your arm? What would the great, what would the tangents look like? Hopefully you can put, can you put your arm up? Parent, put it up higher. There we go, right? The tangent, and you can actually see, don't draw this because it's not actually what we want, but you could draw a horizontal line. That's not very horizontal. Let me try that again. Uh, I'm going to cheat and do this. There you go, that's super horizontal, right? So can you see at that spot, and also down the bottom here, you would have a horizontal tangent, right? So we call these stationary points. Does that phrase ring a bell? Stationary points? It's as if you're moving through this graph, and at that top spot, and at that bottom spot, you just sort of stay still for a minute, stationary, okay? So with your ruler in hand, now you can actually draw something. What I'd like you to do is a vertical line, vertical line, all the way from our stationary points, down to the graph or the plane beneath. So if this is what it's going to look like. Let me make it a bit thicker so you can see. I'm going to draw this vertical line all the way down. So use a ruler and hopefully you can see it extending from my stationary point all the way down to this x-axis down here. I'm going to do it for the first stationary point and I'm going to do it for the second. Okay. Now, we pick these guys out. Because if the tangent, like we said, is horizontal, 
what would the value of the gradient be if your tangent's horizontal? Hmm. It's zero, right? Because you're not rising, you're not going up, you're not dropping, you're not going down. So you've got a gradient, and that's what this next graph is about. You've got a gradient of zero. So that's why you can see my lines, they extend down to, what's this line represent? That's y equals zero, right? Or y dash equals zero, I should say. So I'm going to put an x here and here. This is where my gradient, I think of my original function and where its gradient is zero. It's zero here and it's also zero up there. Are you following with me? Is that okay? So that's why I've got zero here, zero here. All right, for my next part, um, if you've got colors on you, they'll be handy but not necessary. I'm going to look back at this original graph and I want to think about at what places is the graph increasing, going up, and at what places is it decreasing, going down, okay? And I want us to mark it out like this. I'm going to give you two examples, right? See this spot here, this part of the graph, okay, over there on the left-hand side, increasing or decreasing? Increasing. It's increasing, right? We always read from left to right, it's going up, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a plus sign there, and I invite you to do the same, because the gradient of an increasing part is positive. Is that okay? Gradient of an increasing part of the graph is positive, so that's my plus sign, okay? I'm going to shift over to red. Can someone point out to me where's a place, just one spot, where the graph is going down, where it's decreasing? What do you reckon? Yeah? Um, between where you put the second x and the second dot. Yeah, fantastic. So in between here and is that here that you were saying? Yeah. That whole slide? Yeah, in fact, the whole section there, it's decreasing, isn't it? Going down. So in fact, we can put more than just one minus sign, negative gradient, I could, like you said, put n negative signs all along here because the gradient all the way along in that section will be negative, okay? I'm going to pause for a minute. You've got a whole graph there. I've only given you a little bit. I want you to indicate with some pluses and some minuses, where do you see the part of the graph that's increasing, that's a plus, or decreasing, that's a minus. Draw as many as you can, fill up the whole thing, and let's have a think about it in a second.